Uh, when I arrived today and stepped off the elevator on the sixth floor, I was pleasantly surprised to see a big gaggle of media, seven or eight TV cameras, uh, five or six reporters, all gathered around sort of aging, middle-aged man, and I don't know Mr. Mendez, and so I thought, oh, wow, that's really good, a great media turnout uh, for this event. Uh, sadly, the graying middle-aged man they were gathered around was the new interim president of Carleton University. Uh, there's another story going on here in the life of the university. It's newsworthy, uh, but regrettably, the same gaggle uh, weren't gathered around Mr. Mendez, and I think I could probably just about stop there, I suppose, uh, but I'll, I'll go on. Uh, two years ago, Carlton hosted uh, an international symposium on the role of the media in the Rwanda genocide. And in his message to that symposium, Kofi Annan saluted journalists for taking the time to think about their role in the events of 1994. And he concluded by saying, there is no more binding obligation than the prevention of genocide. He was addressing those remarks at, largely at practitioners in the news media. Uh, sadly, Preventing genocide is almost certainly not the top priority of most journalists and news organizations. Uh, the news media just does not seem to operate that way. Frankly, I'm not sure working journalists even think of themselves of playing a role in preventing conflict or eliciting early and timely responses to prevent the deterioration of conflict situations into genocide. That is just not part of the thought process. The thought process, I believe, is more about the need to record important events, to give voice to the voiceless, to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, and most important, to tell a compelling, important story. Now that thought process does not necessarily conflict with the notion of preventing genocide, but I don't think journalists conceive of themselves as engaging in an exercise of preventing genocide or preventing anything, for that matter. Um, and that's something I think that we would need to resolve. Yes, there is or should be a sense of social responsibility that we must bring these conflict situations to light. But as journalists, the reality is we seem to be best at recording and reporting conflict once it has reached a certain pitch by acting as witnesses to genocide and other atrocities. The economics of the news business is a key factor here. While it would seem to make sense to go where the news is about to happen, to get ahead of the story, we are frankly more likely to go where the news is already happening, or in many cases has happened, where conflict has broken out or manifested itself as genocide. And there is literally no prevention value in that exercise. We, and in this context, when I say we, I mean Western journalists, the international media, are not so good at acting as the world's early warning system, despite every prescription that we should do precisely that. Journalists react to the same impulses as political decision makers, and conflicts often show up on our radar screen at about the same time as that of the decision makers and the diplomats, or sadly, it's on our radar screen long after it's on the radar screen of the decision makers and the diplomats. Yes, the Western media can definitely have an impact on the dynamics of conflict, indeed on genocide prevention, but there is no silver bullet. Media exposure does not equal or guarantee public pressure and political action. Relatively speaking, the war in Congo, the situation in Darfur, have been somewhat well covered by the media by comparison to the events of Rwanda, at least in a sense of general awareness. Those events are at least being recorded. But Darfur has not been elevated to the level of cause celeb. There is no tsunami effect. There is nothing like the coverage of an event such as the famine in Ethiopia in 1984. And frankly, I don't understand why. Uh, part of the reason I left the daily news media to come and teach and study journalism at Carleton was to try and resolve that question. So I don't have uh, the answer. 
There is a body of research on the role of the media in humanitarian disasters, but there's little on the role or impact of Western media on the dynamics of conflict uh, before, during, and after. There is a textbook case here, Rwanda, and for what it's worth, I've just finished editing the textbook uh, with brilliant papers by Jerry Kaplan, Frank Chalk, and Romeo Dallaire on the role of the media in the Rwanda genocide. There is evidence that Hutu extremists in Rwanda did take notice when the media began to report on the systematic killing of Tutsis. Imagine what impact it might have had if the world's media and its political actors had piled on to this story in the early days. Uh, but they did not. Look at the media and the Rwanda genocide. Without question, the international community failed and news media must share the blame for that. But this is not just about the media role in gathering and disseminating information. I would argue that more often it is about whether or not the media can turn up the volume to the point where the general public will not allow the politicians and the decision makers to stand idly by. So the media role in preventing genocide is not just about shedding light, it is about turning up the heat. Romeo Dallaire argues convincingly that American, British, French, and Belgian diplomats knew damn well, in fact, Romeo would probably say god damn well, what was going on in Rwanda. They had better sources of intelligence than he, than the media, or than the UN did, but they did not act. Dallaire subtitled his book, The Failure of Humanity in Rwanda. The media share responsibility for that failure, but so too do the politicians who read our copy. It's important to discuss the role of the media, but don't always shoot the messenger, as tempting uh, as that might be. What do political decision makers do with the information that we provide? Do they act on the basis of information? Or do they act only when the information is deemed to have had an impact on public opinion, when there is public pressure to do something? We're entering a gray zone here. Is it the role of the media to advocate for intervention in a place like Darfur? Or is it our function simply to record events and let the chips fall where they may? We've heard today about the responsibility to protect. I would argue that journalists and news organizations have a responsibility to report, to shed light, and to turn up the heat. We don't seem to have any reservations as journalists about doing this with domestic stories. My former employer, the Toronto Star, will overtly wage a campaign to shame the government into taking action on homelessness or the plight of the disadvantaged or any, no any number of other social justice issues. We should apply the same standard to our coverage of international affairs, and so far, we have not. <laughs>